One of the most recognizable British actors is a guy called Ben Miller, and we're about to talk to him. He's best known perhaps for starring alongside the brilliant Rowan Atkinson in the Johnny English franchise. If that doesn't tick the box for you, then you probably know him as Detective Richard Poole in the popular BBC series Death in Paradise, which is currently airing in South Africa. And he was the patriarch in Bridgerton, which is, I mean, that's just a worldwide phenomenon. Um, the Secret Gambler, of course, Lord Featherington. And those are just a few of the things that Ben has done in his incredible career. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to cliffcentral.com. Ben Miller, how nice to see you. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So first of all, I, I was looking at your, your incredible uh, biography in terms of the work that you've done as an actor, but I discovered, which is probably far more interesting to me as a nerd, that you were doing a a PhD <laughs> in quantum physics uh, long before the actor thing happened. And to me, the jump from quantum physicist to actor is probably one of the most bizarre things that I've, I've read in anyone's biography. How the hell did that happen? Yeah, well, I, I always wanted, you know, physics is a very unpredictable profession, so I needed something to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just always loved physics, you know, it's just one of my things. I've always loved uh, science and, and physics. Like, yeah, I guess I'm a bit of a nerd as well. So, yeah, so that's what I wanted to study. And I, and I just started a PhD. I wanted to do uh, physics research and um, I started my PhD at the Cavendish in the Cavendish Laboratory is the laboratory attached to Cambridge University right. where I did my first degree and I also did my PhD. And uh Yes. That's where the famous that's where the famous Henry Cavendish discovered a whole lot of chemical elements. It it may be. Mm. <laughs> it, it is. I wouldn't I wouldn't know. But uh yeah, there were, I'm not entirely sure what Henry Cavendish did. Uh that's I know JJ Thompson discovered the electron there. Well, um, little things like yeah. like sodium and potassium and some okay. some fairly important uh, building okay. blocks of the world. <laughs> so I'm thrilled yeah. that you have that this connection. Great. Too. I mean, I, the last thing <laughs> I expected this morning was to learn some facts about. Yeah. Henry Sorry, that's great. Yeah, that's brilliant. We're uh, both nerding out here a little bit, yeah, but I I, I I just love the fact that even you know if you have some kind of understanding of this stuff and. And you obviously have more than just some kind of understanding of it, because people like to throw around terms like oh, particle physics or quantum mechanics or any of this stuff. They throw yeah. it around and then they expect not to be challenged on some nonsense that they read on a, you know, on a on a bubblegum wrapper or something. Yeah. And then someone like you, who they go, oh, he's an actor, and and you say to them, actually, I'll I'll talk to you about uh, about quarks and how how the charges move around inside that, and they they shit themselves because they're not entirely sure they were prepared for this discussion. To be fair, there's not a lot of discussion of quantum mechanics on the set of Bridgerton. Uh, we didn't we didn't get into. Quantum chromodynamics. <laughs> oh wow, wow. Well, okay. Let's let's just start which, off which with which is the quantum chromodynamics is uh, is the of course the um, you know the uh, the study of the interactions between between quarks or quarks. Is it quark or quark? Quarks, quark. I can I can never quark. figure it out. That I, I mean, know. even that's a subject for some for yeah. some controversy. <laughs> But but I love the names for them. There's the up down. There's the 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 charm, and there's strange something else. And charm. Strange, strange, and charm. What great words to top describe beauty, things. Top and bottom, That's which it. can also be which I prefer. Truth and beauty. They used to be called truth oh, and beauty, wow. and it sort of changed to top and bottom, which I don't know if it's quite as, quite as <laughs> now that's something you could discuss on Bridgerton, of course. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots and of tops so we and lots of circle. Yeah, <laughs> that Bridgerton has just been a runaway success. Now, I, I'm sure that you're also um, having been schooled, no doubt, in English history. You're, you're acutely aware of the fact that Bridgerton is mostly fantasy, but there's this amazing thing about period dramas and period uh, fiction, which people just love because the success of shows like Bridgerton, like Downton Abbey, the idea that we could cast our minds back and create these amazing and intricate and very personal universes for people who lived a couple of hundred years ago and, and do them in these places which are still there. They're still extant and they're probably still some of the families that were around in 1700 that inhabit some of them. It's great to have that to draw on. You must have had a lot of fun playing with those characterizations 
and the period stuff because you can be a little bit over the top, but you can also have you know some deep understanding of the history there too, which can can infuse it with with quite a lot of gravity. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, one of the things I did was uh, you know the National Portrait Gallery uh, has an online resource you can go on you can sort of you can put it in any year and you can just dial up portraits from that year and it's really interesting that's the first thing i did is i went and just looked at portraits you know that had been painted in 1813 when the show was set it was very interesting actually because it london society was very diverse that's one of the things that mm. really surprised me you know i expected just to see lots of white faces which is usually what you see in in costume drama and yeah. and it wasn't like that at all. You know, there was a yeah, because of course people were traveling. People were traveling the globe. There was all kinds of um, you know, uh, the slave trade was at its you know at its zenith. There was there were a lot of um, yeah. L London was a very diverse community. That was the first thing that surprised me. Uh, it was then digging in a little deeper and sort of learning a bit um, because we have this thing that you know the Georgian period don't we you know which to me is <laughs> that could be any one of a number of georges that the yeah. georgian period yeah. belongs to that's kind of interesting to learn about george the third and of course we and then i thought oh hang on i know this story the madness of king yes. george the third you know i know this story and that and, the, and that's of course why it's called the regency period because there was a regent at hmm. the time although queen charlotte was basically calling the shots so it's kind of Fascinating. And when you're when you're doing the show, there's a historian on set with you, and you can go and ask them any questions. So just wow. before you can you can say, yeah, I mean you can say anything. You know, it can be from from a question about costume or you know, did people smoke? Um, it mm -hmm. can be a question about absolutely anything. So it's fantastic the detail you learn when you're when you're uh, when you're you know when you're in a scene. It's it's I find it really really. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I find it just, just. So, Ben, did you did you draw any any direct inspiration? Because your character has there's a, there's a bit of a Bo Brummel quality to him, and he was of course a real chap at the time who was also involved in lots of gambling and and peculiarity. Yeah. There, there, there's the regent himself, you know, George the Fourth later, who who was a a real. I mean, he was a big spender on on all levels, and also a profligate gambler, and not necessarily the sort of guy who you'd entrust the nation's finances to. I think it was uh, the Duke of Wellington who had to curb his spending a number of times on things like Windsor Castle. But did you take yeah. some of those those real historical characters and just kind of thread parts of them into? I, I, I need to understand your process because you're so damn good at it, and you make it seem so effortless you're on really screen. Kind. That's very kind of you to say. I mean, uh, the. Yes, I mean one of the things that I was that fascinated me about that time was the double standard. I mean, we all have a double standard, don't we? Really, we have how you're supposed to behave at a wedding, <laughs> <laughs> and then how people really behave at a wedding. And uh, the thing about yeah, the thing about this this period is there was tremendous formality, but at the same time there was. You know, gambling was huge. This is when, um, you know, as in the show, this is when, as they call it, the fancy boxing takes off, betting. Um, there's gambling and, uh, you know, prostitution are, are you know, are the, are the chief pastimes of these men who sort of have this very kind of formal show and then mm. this completely, um, you know, off the hook behavior. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no, also they used to they used to publish those tremendous. I think they were punch cartoons, but a lot of of other stuff was pretty pornographic at the time, and and that was probably the beginning of so much of what we now see on the internet as being you know the day trade of 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 social media, and it yeah. all started in that period. It was it was really the beginning of modernity in some ways. It is. It's the beginning of. Um celebrity isn't it to an extent because where yeah. this is newspapers are taking off for the first time right well not for the first time it's not the first time we had newspapers but it's the idea Wide of spread. scandal scandal sheets and gossip and the yeah. currency of that um that's the scandal sheets this is when they start um and that very much you know that's the seeds of uh <laughs> social media are there aren't they <laughs> um 
Yeah, but I mean, I suppose it, that to, to your point, I think my, I think it is really, it's useful to learn as much as you can, but I always just try and find the character in, inside me. Do you see what I mean? I try and find those bits of me that are like the character and focus on, and focus on those really. So it's 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 almost, you know, you, you you're not trying to um to reinvent them out of whole cloth. You're actually just pulling pieces of your own personality out. Now that makes me curious about what parts of you are in in relation to um, Lord Featherington, which yeah. parts of you are, are, are pronounced there, and then also obviously we have to talk about Richard Poole. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, with Lord Featherington, I mean, it's things like you know. Love for, you know he's an addict isn't he you know he's an active addict essentially um but he's at a it's it's working for him and he's able to conceal his addiction and uh so yeah you know i would just think about you know what am i what am i addicted to and how would i feel if i if i did it wasn't if i couldn't get hold of that thing how would i feel if someone found out that i was addicted to that thing um so yeah, as you think about your own, you know, you, you, your behavior, the behaviors don't have to be the same. It doesn't have to be, you know. But come on, you, you're, you're not saying you're, 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 and prostitution, you're, you're, but yeah, um, I, I mean, you're, 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 not to, you're not about to reveal. You're not about no. to reveal that you're a massive uh, fan of gang, gambling no, and I was prostitution. Saying, coincidentally, those happen to be my addictions, but that was just luck. <laughs> um, it, uh, it it could have been anything, you know, coffee could have been anything. Um, <laughs> sure, but yes, yeah. Yeah, and with Richard Poole the same. You know, Richard Poole is, you know, f from from where I sit, he's a, uh, you know, he's someone who is, I guess you would say, he's on the he he's, he has AS ASD. You know, he's sort of on the on the spectrum essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I just try and find those bits. You know, where, how do I relate? So you know, I would do the. You know the Baron. You know, do the very Baron Cohen ASD tests, and you find out which bits of your own behaviour fit that. And you know, you try and uh, that's my. I think everybody could. This is the other thing. I've been doing it. I've been doing it a while. And I've met a lot of actors, and everybody seems to do it a completely different way. And I just think after a while, you find your own. You know, you find your own way with it. I don't think it necessarily means that's the that would work for somebody else. Um, but you, you're right. You sort of find costume and finding the look and the right pieces of costume for me are really, really important, possibly more important than they are to other people. I'd, uh, again, you know, I've ne you never really inside, you never really get the inside information on how other people exactly do it. But as a director, you know, I know that when I'm working with actors, they, they you have to kind of, you kind of try and figure out how each of them just just try and understand a little bit about he, each of them are approaching what they're doing uh, and, and try and be helpful to, to all of them. And what you come across is the fact everybody seems to have a completely different idea of how to go around it, about it. But for me, costumes really are important. So finding Richard Poole's suit, I worked with a, or I have worked a lot um, with, with the same, um, with the same guy, with the same, uh, Taylor on, on a lot of the so Professor T that I'm doing at the moment I work with the same I, I work with the same guy um, mm -hmm. uh, and it really really helps you know it really helps to to have a long process of you know you're going back and you're trying and he will cut things and you'll go back and we'll change little bits and to get that right really helps me. That's a that that's a really interesting insight and something I haven't heard from an actor before about inhabiting the costume and then finding the character in that too. Yeah. It's probably the wrong way around. I think a lot of yeah. actors probably downplay that because maybe they want you to, th Oh, hang on. I lost you for a say it's all going on in their heads, you know, and, and they've, they've mastered some kind of incredible way of just tapping into these alternate yeah. consciousnesses. Um, yeah. it, it, it must be a really thrilling experience. And again, very few actors in the world get to do this to work on these high budget productions. I mean, you filmed uh, Death in Paradise in, in Guadalupe, right? And, yeah. and to be on these, these, these extensive sets, these, these incredible locations, to work with obviously the people of the caliber that you work with. 
Um, it must be it must be quite a thrilling experience. I mean, many actors are you know stuck in kind of low budget soap operas and will never never experience that. Uh, the the fact is for you, it's it's probably a bit of an adventure too. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I love working on um, studio projects. Essentially, yeah, mm -hmm. I find that um, it, it, to begin with, at the beginning of my career, I found working with studios slightly it was cha it's challenging because there are more uh, you know for better or worse there are, there are more commercial pressures on a studio mm -hmm. shoot i mean not least you know things are costing a lot of money so they've got to get done yeah. you know, things have to be efficient you know things have to be um really well run you know or you know, because they're they're big these are big film units with hundreds of people involved. And, and if, if, if you start to drift off piste, things get out of control really, really quickly. Uh, and I, and I guess they are slightly impersonal in a, in a sense, if you're working on a low, but you know, when you're working on a low budget soap opera or a low budget film, which I've also done, you know, and enjoyed, um, it's more intimate you know you're yeah. you, there's you know in in a sense there's more freedom slightly yeah but, but i love i love the idea of you know i feel like if we're making things what we want i i, I just want to make things for for a wider audience i want to make things for a wide audience you know and i like i like the idea of trying to find projects and characters that are universal that we can all relate to to me that's what i really really you know i really really enjoy that process and i've come to really in, to love working with studios actually because you sort of understand after a while that um even the people in the organ the people in the studio the studio is so big that they don't they don't necessarily you know they uh everyone finds their own way through you know but it's it's exciting it's exciting to walk onto a set where well or sets like bridgerton's like a like yeah. three major feature films at the same time i mean it's just there are often i don't know if we ever had three sets going at the same time i think we did mm -hmm. we certainly often had two you know there would be two directors working simultaneously on different sets shooting different parts of the different parts of the project and that scale is is it's very very exciting you know you can't not be excited by absolutely uh, you know the power of the engine you know behind the show i'm also curious about the the the, the pressure of it because it's always astonished me how actors can learn complicated lines and monologues i mean this this even goes to the world of theater which i i really have enormous respect for people who are able to mm. you know reproduce and and to to copy and paste this stuff into their heads i mean i can't remember three lines if people ask me to record it do you feel a lot of pressure to deliver and have you ever got to the set and thought oh my god i'm woefully unprepared i think i might just be in trouble today and something because you again as you said the commercial pressures of some of these recordings are quite enormous and the more takes they have to do with you the more they eventually probably start to look at you askance <laughs> and with, yeah. with a, lot, a lot less awe and sympathy and, and perhaps some irritation how, how does that work from your point of view well the answer is yes i have been on a set and felt unprepared and and my answer to that was to, i learned pretty early on you know that that wasn't the way to do it that that mm. that you need to prepare a lot you know you need to prepare a lot um and so yeah i i've got a routine that i go through for learning lines i've learned i've learned you know i have i've discovered ways that for me help me learn the lines and i'm i'm trying to get the i'm trying to get i feel like you haven't even started until you know that until you know the lines back backwards, you haven't even start. You can't really do anything. When I, I when I'm on the set, I, I don't want to be. I, I want to have left that period way behind. You know, I want to mm. know the. 
I want to learn your line. I'm, I'm going to learn my lines and your lines, and I'm going to learn this the direction. I'm going to talk to as many people as possible. I'm going to try and figure out how the scene is being shot because it's not just about you, you. You know, it's also about how is the scene going to be lit. What What are we shooting today? What order are we shooting it in? When do we expect we might get to this scene? When do we expect we might get to that scene? If we can't shoot that scene, is there something else that we might shoot instead? Because that's the other thing. You don't want to get caught out, you know, because things can change yeah. very quickly. And, and suddenly you're, you, you're, you, you're going to, so you've got to, it's, it's about, it's very interesting, actually. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. I mean, it becomes about not just the lines, but it's also the, so many other things that are going on that day. And you can't, yeah, you just I'm just always trying to find out information, you know, when which way is the camera looking at the beginning of this scene? When are we going to turn around? How long is the relight going to take? What's the thing? So the more information you have, the more preparation you have, the better you can pace yourself is another thing, because they're long days. You're getting well, up you at see, like absolutely. five in the morning filming to late and at night. We as the audience only see the finished product and we only see what looks really good or what looks right for the story. And we don't know about all of this stuff. And a lot of people have this very uh, jaded idea that acting is all just really glamorous and any old drug addict can come along. And, you know, as long as they deliver the lights, because there were always stars who, who, who seemed to do that. They made it look easy, but that doesn't mean it is. And, and very often in these shows and, and in these monstrous productions, um, it might not even be you. Someone else lets the side down and you have to compose yourself. I'm just, I'm curious also about, are there bad days? I mean, are there days where you just aren't in it and you try and try and try, but it's just very hard to get to the point where you feel comfortable enough to do the no, best job you can do? No, there aren't, there aren't bad days, but there are, you know, every scene is different. You know, every scene you're going to shoot is different. And, and every, you know, every scene that you might, every scene you might do. So for example, maybe the scene's got to be funny. So mm. that's really hard. There's all kinds of technical, you know, there's all kinds of technical things you're going to have to get right for it to be funny. Maybe you're, it's a very emotional scene. Maybe you're going to cry in mm. the scene. So how are you going to prepare yourself for that? Uh, are you going to try and hold the emotion in? Are you going to show your emotion? I think it's simple things as well. Like if we were doing a scene together, um, uh, who wants to go first? Because generally what happens the way a scene is shot is you shoot one way, you light one way and shoot one way. And then you have a period where the whole set is relit and you shoot the other way. Um, so generally you either go first or second in a scene, you know, you're either the first person and you'll be on for an hour and a half. You'll be doing your lines and the other person will be off camera and then things will switch around and, you'll be off camera and the other people, the other person, the camera will be on the, on the other per people in the scene. So that's another thing. Do you want to go first or second? You know, and this is a conversation you can have with the director. You might say, look, the way I, I feel with this, I just feel that um, I, I want to be a bit more spontaneous in the scene. So if I could go first, that would be great. Or you might say, you know, I want to be just so relaxed. I, I want to, I want to, I, I, I want to be really holding in all my emotions. So can I go second so that I'll play it off screen with emotion, then I'll hold that emotion in when the camera turns around. There's a lot of, um, like I say, there's a lot you're working with. This is what I love about filming is you're, what you're working with a room full of, of creatives who are the very, very best people in their field. It's the best, you know, the best cameramen, the best directors, the best sound guy, you know, and you, Talk to them constantly throughout the process. You're getting advice from them and trying to figure out the best way to do it. So there aren't bad days, but you know there are there are challenges, and the challenges weirdly are the, often the things that make the scene the most interesting. So you know if you turn up and um, yeah, you know whatever it is, uh, there's blinding sunshine in your face when you're when you're. <laughs> <laughs> your bit of the scene and you can't <laughs> you just really can't see you think well how am i gonna what am i gonna do that uh, you know what am i gonna do how are we gonna use this to help the scene and you and you might think well you know in real life people hold their hands up when yeah. when the when the when the sun is up so maybe i'll just and i've 
you know, I've I've done that in in shows and just said, okay, well, I'm going to hold my hand like this. It's it's bright, and I'm just gonna I'm not going to pretend it's not bright. Just mean it's such. I think what what how can I use, how can I make this nat look natural? Yeah, I'm, I'm I promise I'm not trying, and I hope you don't think I'm I'm deconstructing everything here to try and, uh, and and break it apart and find some formula for what works in comedy or in drama or anything else. Because I don't know, I'm not an actor, but it is fascinating for those of us who are not in the business you're in to know things like the fact that they light the one side, record that side of the dialogue, and then do an entirely yeah. different setup. I mean, most of us don't think that way. We see the show only in its finished form. Um, yeah. Can I can I ask you about Professor T for a second? Because this criminology, you know, the true crime stuff, which is so popular and solving crimes and all of that stuff. This is probably one of the most popular genres in the world and has been for years now. I mean, that I don't know how many CSIs there are, but there must be 500 of them by this stage. And people can't get enough of this stuff. And to develop a character who's interesting and eccentric as a criminologist, it did. I hope you don't mind me saying this and, and I'm not sure whether you, 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 you like or you consider it a compliment, but I, I think of, of Hugh Laurie in, in House and I think of you and Professor T and there's something just on, on, a, on a level above the obvious with those two characters, which I find really alluring and interesting and it makes the whole solving of crimes and solving of medical problems that much more interesting. Uh, these people are so real. Yeah, and I think, well, I mean, I love House. I think it's, I just think... Uh... Hugh Laurie's, I mean, I just have always loved everything he's done, you know, and he, funnily enough, he started in comedy as well, you know, doing sketch shows. Uh, yeah, he also by... worked with Rowan Atkinson as you did. He did. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I've been lucky to, I've been directed by Hugh in a, in a oh, wow. short film that he, he made. Um, and I remember sort of sitting with this car. So I was quite young, you know, sitting this, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much older than me he would be, but it's probably between five and 10 years, something like that. But yeah. he was kind of very much a kind of leading light, you know, leading light. And I was in this short film he directed. I was so, so excited to be in this, this film, which also incidentally had Rick Mayle and Adrian Ed Edmondson in it. And um, yeah, I mean, had some, had some amazing actors in it. And I remember saying to him in the car when he dropped me off at the station, <laughs> I said, he, what do you think I should be doing? Do you know what I mean? Because I, you know, I'm, yeah. I, you know, I love, you know, what, what would your advice be? And he said, <laughs> he said, I, I, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, maybe I, you should be doing that sort of leading man stuff. Uh, yeah. Anyway, tell you how, tell you how. And I thought, um, wow. And it was a oh, real that's great. I mean, he won't know, but that was a huge <sighs> uh, boost. To me, you know, I was thinking, okay, yeah, maybe I should give that a go. Um, I think what House and Professor T have in common is there's a certain kind of authenticity to them. Hmm. Uh, they are, um, you know, there's a certain level at which intelligence is a, is a sort of handicap, right? You know, I mean, it, it's great. You can you you can uh, you can be sort of incredibly perceptive about um, what might be causing um, some mysterious ailment, or you might, like Professor T, almost instantly be able to tell who who has committed a crime and how they committed it. Um, you know, I think. Aren't they all What's descendants it? of? Aren't they all descendants of Sherlock Holmes? Oh, Holmes. In some yeah, way? exactly. Yeah, yeah and, and the um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The uh, the archetype of all these is Sherlock Holmes. It's like the really, really intelligent sleuth who mm -hmm. is absolutely bloody hopeless with people. I mean, and it's. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's. I mean, you know, and it's you know, it rings true, doesn't it? As well, you know, what I love about Professor T and his is the fact that he's usually figured out pretty much immediately who's done it. He's his challenge is then to prove it. Is yeah. to is to to be able to um and he can't often you know, often he can't give too much away to the other people investigate, you know, to the the police team, you know, to the investigative team that he's working with 
because they would they would mess up his method of trying to catch whoever it is who's done it. I mean, it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting take on the whole thing, isn't it? It's, it's very simple. House is quite similar. I mean, he figures out very quickly, doesn't he? Usually in each episode, yeah. exactly what exactly what the if you like the solution is. So mm. is a, there's a slight riff on um. They're, they're a slight riff on Sherlock Holmes, but there's a lot of they've got a lot of there's a lot of DNA in common, isn't there? I I have to ask you about something that is of peculiar interest to me, um, and it's because <laughs> I'm a massive fan of of British sketch comedy and and your Armstrong and Miller, <laughs> um, which which is tremendous. Uh, you know, it's always these duos. It's it's fry and laurie it's it's you and 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 on armstrong it's french and saunders you know and you've been in and you've been in a couple of these i, I mean there are the the one of my i think he's totally underrated but harry enfield you know and and paul yeah. whitehouse these are such tremendously talented extraordinarily funny shows that it just seems doesn't matter how much time has elapsed between the last time i watched them and, and the more recent time and i do repeatedly watch them they're always as funny as the first time. And and this yeah. is a curious thing about British sketch comedy. And I wondered if you could help me understand what it is that makes people like me such acolytes of this stuff. Because to see it done from our point of view again, it just seems like it's it's just the most fun in the whole world to make this stuff and to sit there and come up with the ideas and these characters. Good God. Yeah, well, it re it really is so much fun they are so much fun to make i mean it's not that's that's absolutely i mean i can't think of i can't think what could could be more joyous than than doing sketches in a sketch show i mean it's it's a complete i mean it is it's a complete it's such a privilege because Sketches are expensive to make. You know, it, every sketch you've got a different set and a whole load of new costumes and different <laughs> actors, and and it's just wonderful. And you get to spoof your favorite TV shows. You get to pretend yeah. to be in movies. You can, you know, uh, you can, the, the silliest, sillier the idea, the funnier it is. They are yeah. um, what I figured out, uh, or what Alexander Armstrong and I figured out eventually was like making a sketch show is is like making muse muesli so what what you do is you is you decide okay we need some cut we need some currants you know we need some rolled oats you know we need some uh, nuts in there for flavor you know we need a bit of we need some berries and you right. think of as many different kinds of joke as you could, as many different kinds of sketch. In other words, they sort of thrive on variety. And the more different you can make the individual pieces. So you try and have some things that are incredibly short, some things that are really long. Mm -hmm. So each time when you're watching the show, you're never sure whether the thing is going to last two seconds or it's going to be two minutes long, uh, whether the joke is going to be right at the end or, you know, you're just like, you just never know what's going to, that's the idea is to try and put the audience in a, in a state of surprise constantly. Um, so that's why I think they, they endure is they are, dis everything about a sketch show is designed to surprise the audience, just to, to, it's almost to establish a rhythm, then break the rhythm. Then you're going to have a visual sketch and you're going to have a verbal sketch. And you have something long, something short. You're just trying to make muesli, trying to make as many different ingredients as possible. And then, and then when you put them together, you pour on the uh, non-dairy milk of your choice. Yeah. Gluten-free, uh, whatever it might be. Yeah. Gluten-free almond milk or whatever it is yeah. that you want. And yeah. then, and yeah. you have something that really is really, really satisfying. None of those things individually would be satisfying at all. You know, a whole load of very short sketches. Right. Maybe the fast show is a is is a bad example. Uh, but what you know, that's what we that's what we figured out. So I think one of the reasons I love Monty Python is I'm I'm constantly surprised and Fry and Laurie as well. It just yeah. and also there's that element you think they can't do that. <laughs> Constantly. And they do. <laughs> and yeah. they do. Well, you know, I, I'm very aware of your time here, and there's just one last thing I'd, I'd like to know mm. because comedy is something that you're you're 
just really gifted at and and it's something that very few people can do effectively and 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 the subtlety is sometimes you know the the thing that people don't always get right but do you think that comedy is in any trouble in a very politically correct world where we see increasingly that people are more careful than ever to not step on toes and where everything is considered to be you know moderately offensive to someone and if you're offensive to the wrong people you might just not make it through the the production let alone the day um does that ever enter into your your concern especially because you know, it's, it's probably outside of the scope of, of being in trouble for things like Bridgerton or Professor T or any of yeah. that stuff. But, but when you're creating your own thing, uh, you think we could, we could still make that stuff now? Yes, I do. And, and thank you. You know, thank you for, for your kind, you know, for your kind uh, comments. I, I, um, I love comedy and I think comedy is really important. I mean, I, I, I'm one of those people, slightly tedious people who think, Comedy is an art, an art form. I don't think it's just. Uh, I think comedy can be art, and you know, my favorite, the the comedy I love, I, I consider that. I consider that to be art. I consider French and Saunders to be art. Mm. I consider Monty Python to be art, and it's important. Um, you know, artists have always. There will always be a struggle for expression, and. Um, in a sense, you want to sort of, you know, it's your it's your it's your job in that art form to push against whatever constraints, you know, whatever constraints are being put on you. You know, people will always say, "Oh, you can't say that," or you know, "You can't do that." You can't make jokes about this. You can't make jokes about that. Um, and I think it's comedy's, you know. It, it's the job of the comedian, I think, to think really carefully about what the joke is, particularly what the target of the joke is. Uh, people often mistake. Uh, Ricky Gervais is very good on this. Uh, uh, he, as he puts it, and I th- and I haven't heard it put better. People often mistake the subject of a joke for the target of a joke. So you need to think about what the, you know, who is this. What point is this joke making? And do I agree with that point? Not, oh, you shouldn't have nudity. You know, oh, you yeah. shouldn't, um, you shouldn't do, shouldn't put on accents. Oh, you shouldn't. You don't know. Think about what the target of the joke is. I think this is a great time for comedy. I think also comedy is really alive and well. I mean, nearly all the popular videos on TikTok are comedy. Um, you know, the same, same on, um, it's just moved into a different area. It's just, it's on social, it's on social media. And it's exciting because the people doing it are very young. You know, they haven't got TV shows. They're kind of, mm. you know, um, uh, I think there's a lot of great, great comedy on social media. It's, you're right. It's not particularly on, on TV at the moment, but I, that's always mm. been the case. Things, it's always gone in a, it's always been a, it's always either been in fashion or, or out of fashion, and it's funny since I've been doing it. It's been in, it's been out, it's been in, it's been out. Right. You sort of, uh, you know, you kind of get used to that after a while. Um, and also, the un- the important thing about comedy as well is, unlike a lot of, oh, well, actually, as I say, unlike a lot of art forms, actually, some drama has to innovate as well. But comedy has to innovate. Its form has to change because it has to. You can't. You know, we, we, it doesn't work for us to go and sit and watch Vaudeville now. I mean, it wouldn't, mm. it was cutting edge and fantastic at the time. Sure. But, but comedy also needs to have a cutting edge form. So the sketch show needs to evolve as well. We can't go and making the same shows that we made. Yeah. You know, we can always enjoy them and we can always enjoy sure. the previous ones, but it's got the form has to move on. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think comedy is doing really well. It's just moved into a different, area well uh death in paradise is currently on bbc channel 120 at seven every night filmed on location as we just heard in guadalupe in the caribbean and uh the professor t uh, show which is also on Britbox, you got to watch that uh there are lots of other shows that um i encourage you to go and take a look at the filmography of 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 Ben Miller, if you really want to be impressed <laughs> with someone who's who can do as many diverse things as it's possible for an actor to do. It's such a great pleasure to speak to you, Ben, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was lovely to talk to you. Lovely chatting to you. 